Formula One is freaking sketchy. 55 F1 drivers have died in their race cars since F1 began. That's one out of every 14 drivers ever. But since 2017, there hasn't been a single death and only five since the year 2000. So what changed? Well, the short answer is, a lot, but it wasn't just changes to rules and regulations. It was a much larger shift in the entire culture of F1 led by some of its most influential drivers, ones that challenged the FIA and changed what it meant to race in Formula One. But to understand that shift, you need to understand F1 at its most dangerous, the early years of F1. The first Formula One races took place in 1948, but the world championship as we know it wasn't devised until 1950. Let me paint you a picture. The first championship race was held at Silverstone. It was a cool 12 degrees Celsius day, the perfect temperature for optimal performance from the Alpha 158 and Maserati 4Cs that dotted the grid. These cars were beautiful. They were fast. They sounded the business. And they were death traps. No seat belts, no roll cages, just a velour sofa seat, a fire breathing engine between your legs more or less, and a quarter inch of aluminum paneling surrounding you. There was absolutely no consideration for safety. They didn't even wear helmets or race suits. The rules for clothing were literally, wear what you fancy mate, which meant cotton overalls, t-shirts, goggles if you were smart, and a skull cap in case you got cold. Maybe it was ignorance, maybe it was just pure bravado, but either way, drivers back then understood. Lining up on that grid meant that you believed death was just an acceptable risk in this sport. And who were these drivers? For the most part, older dudes. The average age was 39, and three of the drivers were over 50 years old. Nothing like the F1 grid today, unless you count Fernando Alonso, who probably raced at Silverstone in 1950. But for those guys back then, at the age of 40, you had already seen a lot of war, death, and destruction. So hurtling around a track at 180 miles per hour in what was essentially a bobsled screwed together by wine-drunk Frenchmen probably didn't seem like such a bad idea at the time. And surprisingly, Surprisingly enough, 1950 went pretty smooth. Nobody died, and the same in 1951, but their luck wasn't to last. In 1952, F1 saw its first casualty. Now, to be totally fair, it wasn't technically at an F1 event. It was at an automotive engineering company's test track. During testing, Cameron Earl lost control of his English racing R14B and rolled several times. He later died in the hospital due to a fractured skull which, considering what F1 cars looked like at the time, was almost an inevitability. Ironically enough, 1952 was the first year that Formula One required safety helmets to be worn. And you know what those first helmets were made out of? Cork. And you know how well those cork helmets worked? They didn't. A clump of leftover wine bottle stoppers is not a particularly effective barrier between asphalt and your dome at 100 miles per hour. So. Just don't flip over your car then, you might say. Great advice. But there's one thing you were missing about drivers of the era, and that is inexperience. You see, to be an F1 driver today is nearly impossible. Typically, you start off karting as a child and any later than eight years old, and you may as well save yourself the heartbreak and just quit. Then if that works out, you work your way to a junior single-seater car, then maybe you work your way up to the next level of Formula cars, then Formula 3, Formula 2, and then maybe you get enough points to get an FIA super Super license and then get selected to be one of the 20 driver's seats on the grid. But back then, you just needed enough money to build a car and pay your entrance fee. And that's precisely where things got exponentially dangerous. Take Mario Alborghetti, for example, a wealthy Italian who commissioned a couple of designers and engineers to build a Grand Prix car for him. His first race was the 1955 Powell Grand Prix, a street circuit known at the time for its complexity. And to give you an idea of his pace, Alborghetti Borghetti was over 19 seconds behind pole during practice. And during the race, he hit the wrong pedal on a hairpin and crashed into straw bales. He went flying, his helmet was torn off, and he suffered fatal chest and head injuries. Mario Alberghetti died at his first ever F1 race. It was 
awful. And just a few months later at the 1955 Le Mans disaster, which we have a video on linked below, it made it very clear that safety was something that needed to be brought to the forefront. So going into the 60s, Formula One and the FIA began to implement changes in an attempt to reduce risk to drivers while keeping F1 growing. Open wheels were mandated, fueling was regulated, roll bars were finally required, and seatbelt anchoring was standardized. Oh, and yes, they finally addressed the dress code by making racing overalls mandatory. Of course, it wouldn't be another 12 years until the overalls had to meet a fire resistance standard, but it was something. And that something was a huge step forward from the Wild West of just 10 years prior. But the plan, it wasn't perfect. F1 was still the deadliest sport in the world. And in the 1960s alone, 14 F1 drivers died. And it was that ever-present danger that led one driver to change the trajectory of the sport forever. Sir Jackie Stewart. Just like how our sponsor Carly changed car DIY forever. This is Bob, and this is Bob's 10 second car. <laughs> Bob doesn't have the best luck with cars, but lucky for him, he has Carly. You probably think diagnosing a car looks like this, but with Carly, it's easy. Carly can easily read and clear fault codes so you can diagnose your ride before you hit the streets. That's why she's spitting. And with Smart Mechanic, you can get professional tips and info so you're never left guessing what's wrong. Carly can also activate features with its coding functionality and show you live data so you can keep track of exactly what's going on under the hood. Now this is a 10 second car. So hit the link in the description to join the Carly family. And take control of your ride. Jackie Stewart started his F1 driving career in 1965, and by the end of his career in 1973, he was the most dominant driver since Juan Manuel Fangio. And being so involved in the sport meant that he had seen his fair share of tragedy. In that era, if you raced for longer than five years, the odds of you dying behind the wheel was two out of three, which meant that for many people on the grid, they were more likely to die racing than to live. And with his friends and peers regularly getting injured, Injured or worse, Jackie took it upon himself to try and make F1 safer. But the worst part was he was alone. Basically, the entire grid opposed all of his propositions, saying that he had no guts. 27 race wins and three championships to his name, and he was the one that had no guts? It was false bravado, and Jackie Stewart knew it. So he kept pushing the Formula One administration and the FIA to make some changes, and eventually, they did. In 1968, the FIA enforced shatterproof visors on all helmets. In 1971, they regulated that a driver must be able to evacuate the cockpit in under five seconds. And in 1972, six-point harnesses were mandated, a huge step forward for safety. A step taken only after Jochen Rintz Lotus had a failure that put him into a wall, and because his seatbelt was improperly fitted, he slid down into the cockpit and suffered fatal injuries. It seemed like for every safety push in Jackie's era, there was an awful disaster on track to show how dangerous things still were. And that's why he knew he needed to ensure changes didn't stop in the cockpit. The tracks themselves needed to be safer too. In 1970, circuit designs needed to include considerations for racing incidents. For example, track verges, the part between the track and the wall, needed to be at least three meters wide. Double guardrails had to be implemented on dangerous corners, and spectators had to be at least three meters behind fencing at any given time. There were also gradient change regulations, as well as track width minimums. These were some of the biggest shifts towards a safer F1, and laid the foundation for what racing looked looks like today. But even still, the disasters in F1 didn't just stop. In 1976, arguably the most well-known F1 crash in history took place. A week before the German Grand Prix, Niki Lauda pleaded with his fellow drivers and the FIA to boycott the upcoming race at the Nürburgring Nordschleife. Lauda argued that the Nürburgring was just not prepared to handle another Grand Prix, the track was too big, there were too many blind corners, and there weren't enough fire marshals, medics, or safety cars. If anything happened, it would be minutes before emergency responders could get there, and that could prove fatal for anyone in an accident. But nobody really took him seriously. This was the German Grand Prix. You can't cancel the Nürburgring. So 
they race. And well, many of you know what happened next. Nicky Lauda himself crashed and his car burst into flames, trapping him in that inferno. And it wasn't the medics or safety teams that rescued Lauda from that fireball. It was his fellow F1 drivers that stopped mid-race and pulled him out of his car to save his life. The worst part perhaps was that Lauda's helmet wasn't properly fitted to his head. So his helmet slid off in a way that exposed his face to the fire. And well, you've seen Rush. That race made it clear that F1 was just not prepared for the worst case scenario. And Nicky Lauda's crash forced the administration's hand to implement new policies and regulations like an emergency helicopter and the banning of the Nordschleife in Formula One. Even still, through the rest of the 70s, three more F1 drivers died. Going into the 1980s, it was clear that things were going to get worse because of a little something called ground effects. Colin Chapman at Lotus discovered a revolutionary new way to utilize downforce on his Lotus F1 cars. With custom side pods and side skirts, Chapman's Lotus could be glued to the ground. And that meant that the cars became so much faster. Lap records were obliterated and the speed of F1 cars grew at a much faster rate than safety regulations could keep up with. Plus, these early aerodynamic systems could often be a little unpredictable. Given the right conditions in a turn, the air could essentially sweep under the car and send you flying. And you can bet there were a few casualties. The big one was when Alfa Romeo driver Patrick DiPaia was killed at a practice session at Hockenheim. He was going flat out on the very high speed Ost curve when he had a suspension failure. And with the speed he was traveling along with no safety fencing in the corner, there was just no chance for him when he hit that wall. It was so bad that in 1982, ground effects were banned. But still, it wasn't all doom and gloom in the 80s. There were some other great innovations made in this era of F1, like carbon fiber monocoques and crash test requirements for the front end of F1 cars. And by the end of the 80s, there were four deaths in F1. Awful, awful tragedies, no doubt, but a huge leap forward from the 12 deaths of the previous decade and the 40 plus that died in the previous three. It was a testament that these safety regulations were indeed making it safer in F1, all while the car still continued to get faster. And the 1990s continued that trend. In 1990, quick release steering wheels were made mandatory and all marshals and medical staff needed to have experience in pulling drivers out of the cockpit. In 1991, standards for seat belts, fuel tanks, and roll bar testing became much more stringent, but the biggest change of the early 90s was the introduction of the full-time safety car. That's right, before this, there was no permanent safety car. In the past, they were used here and there, but only on a rare occasion was there one readily available. But despite all that, Nobody was prepared for what was to happen in the 1994 season. To understand that though, we need some context on what F1 looked like by the early 90s. In the mid 80s, the grid was turbocharged. It didn't matter if it was a Alfa Romeo V8 or a Honda V6 or a BMW 4 banger. If it was on the grid that year, it had a turbo. And during qualifying session, boost pressure wasn't regulated. So seeing engines well over a thousand horsepower was normal. The FIA felt that power levels were getting too dangerous. So they started limiting boost pressure to four bar or about 60 PSI, and when that wasn't enough, two bar. But that was still too much power. So in 1989, the FIA said, y'all are out of control and we're banning turbos. So going into the 90s, the grid looked nothing like the 80s. Every car was naturally aspirated, powered by eight, 10, or 12 cylinders, all three and a half liters. So power became more of a level playing field and the engineers shifted their focus elsewhere. Electronics, advanced anti-lock braking, active suspension, traction control, you name it. Well, the FIA once again felt that this was making the grid too uneven, making it more about the cars than the drivers. So the FIA did what they do best. They banned all driver aids for the 94 season. And unfortunately for basically everyone, 1994 turned out to be a nightmare. It all unfolded at Imola at the San Marino Grand Prix. Jordan driver Rubens Berrichello hit a curb at 140 miles per hour, launched into the air, and hit the top of a tire barrier. The car rolled numerous times and landed the wrong way around. And while he was flipping, Ruben's tongue blocked his own airway and he blacked out. Luckily, medics and safety staff pulled him out of his car and saved his life. But this was only the first qualifying session and unfortunately set the tone for the race. In the final qualifying session, Austrian driver 
driver Roland Ratzenberger damaged his front wing during a flying lap. The damage didn't seem so bad, so he went on another flying lap to set his qualification time. And in the middle of the very high downforce Villeneuve corner, Ratzenberger's front wing broke off and lodged under his car. Because of that stuck wing, his front wheels couldn't make contact with the ground, making him unable to brake or steer, and Ratzenberger crashed directly into a wall with no tire barrier, no safety area, just concrete. He died on impact. Ratzenberger was the first driver in 12 years to die in an F1 car. But once again, this was just qualifying. Less than 24 hours later, the official race at Imola started with a crash. JJ Leto stalled out on the start grid and Pedro Lamy rear-ended him. And it was a hard enough impact that the bodywork and even tires flew off the cars and all over the safety fences, injuring a police officer and eight spectators. A safety car was deployed and the track was cleaned of debris. And then the race continued on the fifth lap. And in the seventh lap of the race, the great Ayrton Senna was going into the Tamburello corner at 190 miles per hour. But when he turned the wheel, his car did not turn with it. Senna, like Ratzenberger, crashed head on into an unprotected concrete wall at an estimated 131 miles per hour. And Ayrton Senna, a worldwide superstar and F1 hero, died right there, live on television. Imola was just three races into the season, and even though investigations were being conducted to find the root cause of these crashes, the media didn't take long to point the finger at the lack of driver aids. One crash at the race start when launch control was outlawed, two crashes at high speed corners with no traction control or ABS, and while the causes of the crashes most likely weren't necessarily related to those rule changes, the F1 administration was being attacked as if they were holding a smoking gun. And with one of the highest profile drivers in F1 history being mourned by the world, they needed to evaluate, adjust, and adapt immediately with new rules. So regulations came hard and fast. Wing heights and clearances, front wing assembly regulations, rear wing assembly regulations, power restrictions, minimum headrest thickness requirements, updated helmets, anything and everything they could think of to prevent another horrific weekend like Imola. They implemented a pit lane speed limit, which in hindsight seems kind of insane that F1 cars were able to go racing speeds down the pit lane. Then in 1995, side crash tests were introduced. And to end the decade, tires were required to be tethered to the cockpit of the car, you know, so they wouldn't turn into projectiles. All of this meant that the next decade would be marked by the most regulations F1 had ever seen in efforts to stop killing drivers. But here's the thing. It wasn't just drivers that were in danger at an F1 race. Those tire tethers I mentioned, well, turns out they weren't strong enough to stop Jarno Trulli's tires from turning into missiles at Monza in 2000. A three-way crash took place at the turn four chicane and Trulli's right rear wheel was torn off his car. And that tire struck 33-year-old Paolo Ghislamberti, a fire marshal at the track, and killed him. So of course, Formula One created even more stringent regulations for tire tethers, yet just seven months later, another tire would take a life at the 01 Australian Grand Prix. Graham Beveridge, a 52-year-old volunteer race marshal, was hit by a rogue tire that came off of Jacques Villeneuve's car in a high-speed crash. The tire flew directly between a gap in the fence and struck Graham at full force, killing him almost immediately. Another life needlessly lost in F1, despite safety regulations being at their most stringent ever. It was a reminder that all of those involved in F1 were still in a constant battle against the sport's dangerous nature. But there certainly was good that came from regulation as well. By now, traction control and launch control were fully allowed and implemented alongside automatic transmissions. And in 2003, the FIA would make the Hans device mandatory. The Hans or head and neck support devices would limit the range of motion from your head and neck by tethering your helmet and anchoring to a collar. And that meant that ideally, drivers wouldn't hyperextend their necks in high G-force crashes, which happens to be the leading cause of deaths in F1 cars up to that. That point. The Hans device is now credited for saving countless lives in motorsports all around the world, reducing neck injuries by an estimated 72%. F1 was now notably safer. No deaths happened in a modern F1 car in the 2000s, not at practice, not during a GP weekend, nothing. In fact, the only driver death in that decade came in 2003, when Fritz Glotz was asked to showcase a 1996 vintage FA17 F1 car. 
His car went airborne after bouncing over a curb, and sadly he passed from his injuries. It was a tragic reminder that F1 cars of the not so distant past were genuinely death traps compared to modern day race cars. The next major change wouldn't come until 2010, when the FIA banned refueling mid-race because and let's be real, after that Joss Verstappen incident, nobody wants to be in an F1 car during refueling anymore. But even though the 2000s were relatively safe, a huge improvement compared to decades past, I wish I could say the same about the next decade. But before we get to the dark stuff, the 2010s actually started out pretty promising. In 2014, we saw the biggest advancement in safety technology since the Hans device, the accelerometer. An accelerometer is an earpiece that reports the g-forces a driver sustains during the race, and specifically during accidents. And this meant that for the first time ever, researchers could analyze every single millimeter second of a crash and use that data to create better, more effective safety measures. It was finally a chance for the FIA to be more proactive in creating new safety measures instead of being reactive to nightmare incidents that happened on track. And in 2016, we got driver-facing cameras, which combined with the accelerometer let engineers see and read exactly what happens in the cockpit. The FIA also made it harder to get into F1 thanks to the new super license requirement, a license that required you to get 40 combined points within a three-year span racing in F2, F3, the W Series, IndyCar, or WEC. All that to say, you couldn't just get lucky a couple of times and find your way into an F1 seat, nepotism aside. But amongst all of these amazing changes to the quality of life in F1, there were still a few tragedies that reminded us of why F1 had to evolve. Like in 2017, when 61-year-old French racer David Ferrer died behind the wheel of a vintage March 701 while racing at the Zandervoort historic historic GP. Or before that in 2014 when Dennis Welch died in a vintage Lotus 18 during the 2014 Silverstone Classic. Once again, reminding the world of the dangers that F1 used to live with. But in that same year, tragedy also struck in a modern F1 car. Jules Bianchi was racing at Suzuka in a heavy rainfall, and on lap 43, he veered off track outside of the Dunlop curve and collided with a wheel loader that was cleaning up a mess caused by a prior crash. Jules was knocked unconscious and then taken to the nearest hospital by car since the weather was too severe for a helicopter, which took 32 minutes. Jules Bianchi never fully recovered and died nine months later from those injuries. It was clear. F1 could never truly be rid of risk, but this crash in particular made it evident that Formula One needed to implement some type of cockpit protection. They entertained any ideas that would help prevent injuries and deaths, even the idea of fully enclosed cockpits. But one idea stood out amongst many, and in 2018, the FIA and Formula One introduced the Halo, undoubtedly the greatest safety implementation ever in Formula One. The Halo was a hoop made out of titanium that surrounded the cockpit of an F1 car that, somewhat controversially, also runs directly in front of them. The FIA ran simulations on multiple crashes in history to see if a halo would have helped reduce injury or even save lives, and the conclusion was that a halo likely would have saved many of the drivers we mentioned in this video and many more drivers we didn't. Like Henry Surtees, who was killed in an F2 race in 09 when a wheel assembly struck him in the head after a crash. Even Felipe Massa's injury could have been avoided from when a spring struck him in the head, an incident that took him out for the rest of the season. It was clear that the halo had the potential to make F1 much, much more safe for drivers, with only a small sacrifice in visibility. And so, F1 implemented the Halo, along with F2 as well, and in just the third round of the F2 calendar that year, a crash took place in which one F2 car landed on top of another one, and thanks to the Halo supporting the weight of the car on top, both drivers came out safe. In 2018, the Halo would end up saving Charles Leclerc's life as well. Fernando Alonso's McLaren went airborne after colliding with Nico Hulkenberg. Fernando's car flew over Leclerc's Ferrari and the right front wheel went straight towards Leclerc's head. But of course, was blocked by the Halo. All three drivers came out relatively fine, but if that had happened before the Halo, well, you can guess what Leclerc's dome would have looked like. And then there's the infamous Lewis and Max crash, where Max's Red Bull landed on Lewis's halo instead of his head. And then of course, there's 2022, when Zhou Guan Yu slid across the track upside down in his car and into the safety fence. If that had happened 20 years earlier, 
he probably would have been dead. But in that car, he was totally fine. Now, there are still dark moments in racing. This much is unavoidable. The most recent deaths actually come from the lower Formula Series at the Spa circuit to be exact, a track layout now under scrutiny for being too dangerous. 18 year old Delano Vontoff died just this past July in a side collision in the exact same corner as the late Antoine Hubert, who died in 2019 in an F2 car. And although it hasn't been the longest streak ever without an F1 death, it's clear that F1 is currently the safest it has ever been. Which perhaps is a little ironic to say, as it still remains the most dangerous sport in the world. It is still a sport in which drivers pilot the fastest cars in the world at speeds well over 200 miles per hour, often at the very edge of even their own tremendous levels of skill. But despite that, F1 has come so far, especially in the last few decades. And while the ever-growing speed and unbelievable technology are what bring the excitement to the sport and bring in new fans from all over the world, for longtime lovers of racing, we know that it's the constant mission to not only make cars fast, but keep drivers safe that keeps this sport alive. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, then you'll probably like our video on the history of the 24 hours of Le Mans, which you can find linked right below. You can check out our Alban merch and join us on Discord by hitting the links in the description as well. I'll see you guys in the next one.